Hello, in this video we'll talk about state and local tax issues. Now state and local tax encompasses all different types of taxes out there. There's state and local income taxes, state and local sales tax, and there's other state and local excise taxes. This is just a general discussion mostly focusing on state and local income tax. However, some of the general principles we're talking about also apply to sales tax issues as well, so it's important to understand that. Now, business entities may be subject to state and local income taxation as well as federal tax. Now, different states tax individuals, entities different ways. There's no uniformity, and that's why state and local taxation is such a complex issue. We could have our own course just alone on state and local tax issues. There's 50 different states in the U.S., but there's plenty of other territories that also have taxes as well. In addition, we have local tax issues. For example, D.C., District of Columbia, has its own tax, and you potentially could be subject to tax in Virginia or Maryland. And then various cities like New York, Philadelphia, have their own city taxes. So it's important to understand, and they all tax different um, groups, possibly um, personal taxation on individuals, possibly taxation on various types of entities. We'll talk about some of those general concepts. Now, all business entities pay property tax and other local taxes, sales taxes. Again, the income tax issue is where some states, they differ. States, counties, and, and municipalities may impose income taxation on business earnings even the earnings of sole proprietorships, partnerships, and S corporations. So the idea is that you've learned in previous discussion that sole proprietorships, partnerships, S corporations are flow through entities. At some state levels, there's actually a taxation on those entities. So it's just like double taxation of a C corporation. You have a tax at the entity level for an S corporation or LLC or, or partnership, and you have a tax um, at the level of the individual. So double taxation, it's possible at the state level for some entities other than C corporations. Very interesting. Now, some states don't even honor the subchapter S election. They just treat all corporations the same, whether you're C or S. Remember that when we talk about S corporations, that was a federal election. Now, most states do honor S corporations, but some don't. For example, New Hampshire, S corporations must pay a business profits tax to the state revenue authority. So there's a tax at the S corporation level. It's not simply just, oh, a pass through. So partnerships and sole proprietorships in some states might not have to pay tax, but S corporation might because that state might not recognize S corporations as distinct from C corporations. So you see how this can all play, all plays together? Very big issue. Some states, Again, like New Hampshire, even tax partnerships and sole proprietorships on their business profits. So again, it really does come down to the state. It's very important to understand. Now, if you're taking the CPA exam or you're taking some general uniform exam that's dealing with state and local tax issues, you're, not, you're very likely not going to have to know specific states and the, um, the types of taxation with respect to all 50 states. You're just going to have, no, have to know more general concepts. Now, I'm specifically talking about Florida because I'm doing the video in Florida just to give you a perspective. But if you're watching this in another state, I strongly recommend watching um, or looking at your respective, your own state and seeing how your, the state taxes various individuals and entities. So Florida does not impose a personal tax, nor does it impose a tax on S corporations or partnerships. But it does impose a tax on C corporations that do business in the state of Florida, including out-of-state C corporations. Now, the rate has changed over the years, so please look that up. Florida also has special tax credits that allow it against um, to offset against state income tax liability, and some of these credits are different than what the federal tax what they allow. There might be credits for certain industries, like the film industry. That was a credit that Florida had for a long time. That's potentially going to be repealed, but that's an example of certain incentives. We want to encourage, okay, the film industry to come from, let's say, um, California, where it's major, to go to Florida to do more. Other states have similar. There's been a lot of filming lately in uh, New Orleans, 
And there's various incentives to do this. So again, just like we have incentives in our own federal tax code, there's also state tax incentives as well. So state and local income taxes paid by business entities are deductible in computing the federal income tax. Almost all states, when you're computing your state income tax, allow you to deduct the federal taxes paid. The idea is that, okay, in federal tax, when you're calculating your federal taxes, you can't deduct your federal taxes paid, but when you're calculating your state um, tax, you can because that would be unfair to have you be basically be, be taxed twice on that item. The tax deduction is usually for the actual cash amount that is paid, not the amount that's accrued, okay? The actual cash amount paid. So let's take a simple example. Let's say that RST Corporation um, is an accrual method C corporation. In year one, it has taxable income of $200,000 and it's US form 1120, so on the federal tax form for C corporations. And all of it's from Florida operations. All they do business is in Florida. Before considering state income taxes, it's $200,000. Now RST makes estimated payments of $3,000 to Florida during the year. That's $3,000 it pays for its taxes. And that's the only tax payment it makes during that year. In March of year two, when it files the Florida year, the 1120 for year one, it pays an additional $5,000 for year one, but it pays it in year two. So what's the taxable income in um, its federal tax return for year one? The amount that can be deducted on the federal tax return that's filed in on that's filed in year two for year one is the amount of cash actually paid in year one. So the three thousand dollars is what actually can be deducted. So we take the two hundred thousand dollar taxable income minus the three thousand dollars of ta state and local taxes paid. So if you go back to the previous slide, notice I said that. It's $200,000 before considering any deductions for state income taxes. So we can deduct $3,000. It's the amount that was paid, not the amount that was accrued. Okay? It's the amount paid in year one, not the amount accrued. That's very important to understand. So the $5,000 additional tax in year um, from year one that's paid in year two, that's going to be deducted in year two. Now, RST expenses $8,000, the $3,000 paid in year one, plus the amount accrued because it relates to year one on its financial statements. This creates a book-to-tax difference of $5,000. The difference between the $3,000 amount paid, which is the amount that's allowed to be deducted on the year one return, and the $8,000 that we expense on the income statement. This creates a book-to-tax difference, and this is an example of what we mean by book-to-tax differences. So on the financial statements and on the 1120, we report a book-to-tax difference for the year of $5,000. See that? Very important. Understand. So let's go on to the next topic. So in computing taxable income for state tax purposes, a company starts with federal taxable income and adjusts for various items. So every state, when you're calculating taxes, for that state, you start with your federal taxable income and you make adjustments, adding and subtracting things out and, and back in. And that's how each state, and, and, and whether something adjusts up or down or whether there's any adjustment for a respective item depends on the state. But this is why almost all states require a tax return to be filed at least a month after the federal tax return is filed. So if you're an individual and you have to file your taxes on April 15th, most states tend to be do a month after May 15th, but you'll see some variety. Some states require maybe um, May 1st, May 30th, June 30th, but almost always you're going to see it's due after because you have to start, the starting point is the federal income tax calculated on the 1040 or the 1120 or the 1065 for the year, and we make adjustments. So you need some time to adjust. So if you work in an accounting firm and you do taxes, and that's what you do, you're, and your comp the company you're doing the 1120 or the 1065 for, you're going to also have to likely do state um, tax returns as well. And when you have busy season, the busy season doesn't end until the state taxes are filed as well because you're doing those, those federal income tax returns, but then you have to do the state um, tax, tax returns after that if the company does business in many states. And that could be, take a long time. It's, it's obviously a, a timing issue because you have to make sure that you get your federal tax return filed first 
and then a month later comes, you have to have the state tax returns filed. Now, if you get an extension for federal tax purposes, usually there is a corresponding six month extension that's allowed for state income tax purposes as well. So it goes hand in hand. Now, all states are different, as I mentioned, they all have different laws. So it, this is why, again, SALT, state and local taxation, can be its own topic. If a company does business in several states, it requires computation for state taxable income depend in each state, and it can be different computations of how we calculate the tax on that, that income. So again, it can be very complex when you have a company that does business in all 50 states, and then you have to look at localities and whatnot. So it can get very, very, very complex. So for purposes of this discussion, just assume that the only thing we're going to add back, we're going to do an example, is with respect to calculating the uh, state income. So we're going to add back the federal taxable income um, and any deduction. I'm sorry, the only thing we're going to add back to federal taxable income is the deduction for state income taxes. That's something you see that's common um, among all the states, is that you, you have to add back the state income taxes that were deducted on the federal tax return. That's very that's that's pretty much across the board. Let me give you some examples of things that usually get added back that um, in the state taxes or things that get subtracted away that they don't allow you to take at the state level but they take at the federal tax level. So one thing is municipal bond interest. A lot of states don't allow you to take a deduction, I'm sorry, not a deduction, a exclusion for municipal bond interest that doesn't relate to its respective state. So if you're looking at calculating state income tax for, let's say, the state of Florida and your corporation, and for the federal purposes, you got a municipal bond interest that you excluded from the state of Georgia, you have to add back that Georgia municipal bond interest in the state of Florida. Because the idea is that Florida only wants you to, to encourage you to do it in its state. See that? So it's, again, an incentive. Other examples include Section 179. Um, depreciation. There's usually addbacks to that or bonus depreciation um, because some states like to encourage more small business growth over just all businesses. So that's an example where small businesses are preferred for certain states um, and, and things like that. They're added or subtracted. Um, there might be something where you get um, that's not even in the federal tax system that you get a deduction for at the state level. So very important. And again, it depends on the state. So if we're just adding back the state income tax is deducted. What we do is we start with the federal income, ta federal taxable income that we calculate. Let's say if we're doing a corporation on the 1120, we add back the state income taxes that were deducted because, again, we're not going to be allowed to do that on almost all the states. And then that creates state taxable income, which is going to be more. Again, there's going to be other adjustments here, but this is just to show you one example. We add it back. We could be subtracting things, adding things, right? Adding back the municipal bond interest for states that are not from the state of Florida, if we're looking at Florida, their Georgia and whatnot. Um, those are some examples. So it's important to keep track of all the items. Now, state taxable income must be a portion among the states. If a company has $100 million of business among all 50 states, you have to determine, okay, well, what, what, how do we apportion that income for each state? Because it's not fair to tax... Um, the whole income in the state of Florida or income that's in Georgia in the, in the state of Florida, you should only be looking at the income from the state of Florida. That's the idea. So let's take an example. If a state, if an if a entity has um, taxable income of $100,000 total, $60,000 might be a portion of Florida and $40,000 might be a portion of Georgia. If that's the case and we're looking at Florida, we need to make sure we're only isolating that $60,000 with respect to calculating tax. Now you might be asking, well, how do we know whether a, whether a specific entity has to pay tax in a state. It's all about the concept of nexus or having some type of connection that obliges a company to have to pay tax. It's all about nexus, connection. Nexus is a legal concept and it differs by each state. Some states have broader nexus and other states have more limited nexus. But one thing to understand is that there's constitutional, through the Constitution and through Supreme Court cases, there's a constitutional idea of nexus through personal jurisdiction, a case called Penoyer, which deals with minimum contacts. Um, whether a entity has enough minimum contacts to have a connection with the state so that it has to be taxed. So it's possible that even though you have some type of general business done in a state, you might not have to pay tax in that state because it doesn't rise to the level of minimum contacts. Very important to understand. That's what nexus is all about. So generally, Nexus does require some type of physical presence in the state. 
office, employees, sales agents. But you might be asking, well, what about like the internet? What if you do internet business in a state, but you don't have any um, offices, employees, uh, sales agents, any type of physical presence? Well, internet brings up a huge issue and, and companies like Amazon, they've created a new set of law or a new set or separate set of law when it comes to Nexus. And there's actually separate guidance out there when it comes to internet and what rises to the level of minimum contacts. And there's actually um, various cases um, going either before the Supreme Court or have gone before the Supreme Court that deal with this issue. So please take a look at that. Some states are claiming Nexus exists simply if a resident can access the company's website and their homes and order products online. This is a very broad view of Nexus, just simply because somebody in a state can actually access a company and they're in that state. That's, that's an example of a very broad view. And some states have gone to that level. Again, you have to look at the Supreme Court, though, if they have any limitations on that. So apportioning state taxable income among the states where business activity takes place is a complicated procedure because each state has its own law about how to do this. So you're seeing a general theme that we have to look at every state, every locality. Most apportionment is done through three a three-factor approach. Relative sales in each state, property owned in each state, and the amount of employees in each state. And um, various states will have different factors on each. Some states might only look at one or two of these items. But most states look at all three, but again, they have different weighted factors. Now, within a state, you can have different industries that have different weighting factors. So, you know, we can do one third, one third, one third, one third for relative sales, one third for property in the state, and one third for the employees. That's one third, one third, one third. Um, a lot of them focus more, though, on, um, on one item over another. And again, depending on the industry you're in in the state, you can have a different weighting factor. All things you have to consider. It'd be hard for, like, for example, the CPA exam to test you on a respective state because what if you're not in that state and the CPA is, again, a, a national exam? So that's just an example of just understanding the general concepts that relative sales, property, and in the state and employees in the state, how those are important factors. So let's look at another example. Let's assume that ABC is a corporation. And they have a million dollars of federal taxable income in, in a year, year one, before considering state income taxes. They also, I'm sorry, ABC does business in Colorado and New Mexico, but only has Nexus in Colorado under um, the definitions of Nexus for Colorado and New Mexico. ABC has the following breakdown of sales um, or income in each state. It's been apportioned. So let's assume that it's been apportioned. I'm not going to go through how we apportion. Again, we use the factors and whatnot. And what we come down to is $900,000 of the million is apportioned in Colorado. And then a million is apportioned. In, I'm sorry, 100,000 is a portion in New Mexico. So 900,000 plus 100,000 is a million. Now, one thing I want to note is that in this example, what you see is that in the two states, the amounts equal the total amount. Okay? It's possible that in some states, you don't have it equaling a million dollars total because of the, or I'm sorry, you have each state is going to compute it differently. So in each state, yes, it will equal out to a million dollars. But that doesn't say that you'll be taxed in all million dollars in all the states because different weighting, different weighting in each state. So let me just summarize that one more time. In each state, yes, when you go through the apportionment, it's going to go through each state on that on that state's own return and it will equal a million dollars. So this is the apportionment in the state of Colorado. But what I'm saying is that in another state, for example, New Mexico, it might not because they have different factors. You might not have a 900,000 and 100,000 in that state. Now, you wouldn't be calculating in New Mexico anyways because if because there's no nexus. But if there was nexus, let's say, it might be 200,000 in New Mexico, 800,000 in Colorado. So it's possible that if we were taxed in multiple states here, let's say we were taxed in both Colorado and New Mexico, it's possible that um, in Colorado, the company would be taxed on $900,000 and in New Mexico, the company would be taxed on $200,000, which actually equals $1.1 million. Interesting case. Usually what you see though is the opposite happening where not all million dollars would be taxable. So maybe it's $900,000 in Colorado and then when you look at New Mexico, it'd be $70,000. So it'd be $970,000 actually taxable with respect to that. Item. Again, because the weighting is different. So see how that works? Very important to understand. So ABC has made estimated tax payments of $50,000 to Colorado for year one, all right? 
it paid an additional $20,000 of year one and year two. Again, we can only do, take into account the $50,000 paid, right, not accrued, only $50,000 paid in year one. On its financial statements, though, it took all $70,000 because it, it does the accrual method. So 50 plus 20 is 70. Based on this information, what's its federal um, taxable income? It's going to be the million dollars total minus the 50000 that it pays of state and local tax in Colorado. Based, again, because there's nexus in the state of Colorado. There's no nexus in, the, in New Mexico, so no tax has to be paid in New Mexico. So we're saying that $50,000 results. So there's going to be $950,000 of federal taxable income going back to, when we look at our example one that we did earlier, how do you do this when you have multiple states? 950, we don't care about New Mexico. We only care about the amount paid in Colorado. And that's taking into account the apportionment. So the book to tax difference of $20,000. Why? Because there was $70,000 accrued, only $50,000 was actually taken into account, $20,000 um, book to tax difference. So as corporations and partnerships must pay income tax to states and impose income on all business entities. So one thing I want to mention here is that this, when it comes to LLCs, LLCs a lot of time are viewed to be the most superior of all the business entities when you're looking at, okay, whether I should be an S corporation, an LLC, or a C corporation. But LLCs actually have a lot of work that has to be done with respect to attorneys going through each state and determining whether an LLC actually does have to pay income tax and that's they actually file a return. I've actually had to do this when I worked in accounting uh, at a big firm. We had to go through a um, an LLC that did business in all 50 states and determine what was the tax law in that each state and determine, okay, based on what we have, will the, our entity be subject to tax on the business entity tax in that state and have to file a return? And um, it was an interesting issue because you go through all 50 states and some states, we, we it, the outcome was no, some states, yes. Some, a lot of it was very gray, okay, for LLCs. Now, one thing I want to mention is that there's a, we're talking about state and local income tax, but there's also what we call franchise taxes. So like um, various states like California and Texas have franchise tax, which isn't ba really based on income. It's more based on your revenue, your total amount. And it, it's basically, it takes, it takes the function of the income tax in that state. And it, it, it has a different, um, it looks not only at income, but it looks at more broad items. So even if a state does not have a business income tax, if the state has a personal income tax and any income of the S corporation or partnership earned in the state and allocated to shareholders and partners is subject to it. So we've learned about S corporations and partnerships, LLCs, right? How the items are allocated. Well, if the items are allocated in that state, it becomes subject to that personal income tax in that state, which is very important. So let's look at an example. Let's say that LST is an S corporation that is chartered in Florida. So it's organized, it's headquarters are in Florida. It was organized in Florida but it does business also in the state of Louisiana. Now, Louisiana nor Florida tax S corporations, but, but Louisiana has a personal income tax. Florida does not. So let's say in year one, LST has $250,000 of business income. $100,000 of that business income was in Louisiana. So $150,000 was in Florida, $100,000 was in Louisiana, let's say. Melanie is the sole shareholder of LST. So there's only one shareholder. She is a Florida resident. How much of the business income is subject to the Louisiana state personal income tax? So even though she's a Florida resident, she's viewed as doing business in the state of Louisiana and subject to the personal income tax in the state of Louisiana. Well, how do you say that? Because the business does, um, because LST does business in the state of Louisiana and it has nexus, right? So it would have to file a return but for the fact that there's no S corporation tax in Louisiana. However, when it's allocated, the Louisiana portion, the one, the hundred thousand is allocated to Melanie. She though, she now has allocation of income flowing to her, which creates income in the state. So that nexus there gets her. And now she's taxed at the personal level in Louisiana. See how that works? Very interesting. So how does this all play out? All hundred thousand dollars will be taxable to her in Louisiana. So again, the question was how much must she pay, uh, must Melanie pay in terms of her state personal income tax in Louisiana, even though she's a Florida resident, $100,000. The whole amount that's allocated to the business, that's allocated to her as a sole shareholder, 
flows to her and again is subject to that. Now Melanie's going to report two hundred fifty thousand dollars in her U.S. ten forty. It's all it all allocates out to her, right? Because she's the sole shareholder. But she's going to have to file a Louisiana state income tax return, even though she's a Florida resident, which has no personal income tax. She has to fi file a Louisiana state income tax return for hundred thousand dollars. Now whatever state income tax that Melanie pays to Louisiana is deductible on her form ten forty for the year, which again she has to report two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So very interesting. So this is just showing you some very general discussion issues of state and local taxes. And really, I focused on income taxes. Now, one thing I think you should do is look up your state, wherever you're watching this video, and see, okay, well, what do I have a personal income tax in my state? Do I have, what about the business entities? What kind of taxation do they have in the state? All right. Is there a taxation on S corporations or partnerships? A double taxation, like we have for C corporations at the federal level, it's possible they do. We we saw New Hampshire as an example, so please take a look at that. All right, so I hope you enjoyed this video.